All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, we live with each other, so we have. Uh, there's a lot of germs that have gone they back are. and forth between yeah, the two. Dude. Well, hey, it's an honor to be with you guys, and um, again, um, I consider it a, a privilege to serve here in this church, uh, serve as an elder here. I want to let you guys know how proud I am of you. 2020 is a year, as at least you say, it's a year. You know what I'm saying? And 2021, it's evil twin uh, sister is right here with us. And so, um, and so, but I'm proud of you guys because let me tell you this, that it has been a lot mentally, emotionally, physically that we all have experienced, um, but you're here, you know, you're joining us online. And I want to tell you, listen, sometimes in life, like, you know, it's the little things that you just need to celebrate, right? In your life. So I want to let you guys know I'm super, super proud of you as an elder here. Um, I come from Tallahassee uh, where I've been married to my wife, Wendy, be 20 years this summer. Um, and Clayton and Kelly stood at our wedding together, one of the hottest days known to human history. Uh, to this day, I believe recorded you know, in Atlanta, Georgia. And so, um, uh, but we have three kids, Jalen, 16, Brooklyn, 13, and Peyton, who's 10. Um, as Clayton said, I pastor a church called Engage. Uh, we are a church uh, that is um, a church that was started around eight years ago with 18 of us um, in our living room uh, that has grown tremendously. Uh, we are multi-ethnic. Um, we are, have different people from different political backgrounds. I mean, we are split ethnically right down the middle. We are split politically down the middle. So you guys know it's really fun right now, pastoring a church like that. Um, you know, my dad always jokes with me. He's like, you know, he's like, son, he's like, you really picked a great time to pastor a multi-ethnic church in the South, right? I was like, yeah, thanks, dad. Appreciate the encouragement. Um, you know, one of your gifts of the spirit. But, um, but you know, as Clayton said, I, I'm, um, you know, I, I love starting things, um, being an entrepreneur, um, and my wife runs a business. We've done these things, and I love doing it. And here's the reason why, not because I don't have anything to do. I just actually believe that um, one of the calls of my life is actually, as a Jesus follower, is to go to the idea of human flourishing. I believe the first call of humans we see in Genesis is go into the world and make something of it. And so as I go into different spaces, whether if I'm working with Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies, it's actually bringing the kingdom when I go there. And if I am you know, working in athletics, I am the radio, I do commentating for Florida State basketball right now, which is a great time to do that. And so um, I, I just bring, I feel like the kingdom wherever I go. And I believe that that's what God's ultimately doing in the earth. He's releasing and launching people to go and to be who he's called them to be. As the Bible will talk about this idea of what we call it engage, we call it innovative reconcilers, that God is launching innovative reconcilers into the world. And so today, I really feel God's giving me a word very clearly, very specifically for you. So I want to jump right in, okay? And so I'm going to pray for us and we're going to dive in and get to work. So Father God, we thank you so much for who you are. We say, come Holy Spirit, reveal God the Father, reveal Jesus the Son. Father, I pray today that we would have a moment, but I pray the moment today would lead to a movement. We give you all the praise and glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The title of my sermon is this. is called The Madness of Crowds. The Madness of Crowds. Now, um, I believe I have a superpower, but that superpower has not manifested itself yet. My superpowers, I believe I can stack meeting upon meeting, finish those meetings on time, and get to my next meeting on time. Now, to this day, it still hasn't happened yet, but I believe that it's dormant, and you know, in the right time, it's going to reveal itself in the right time, you know what I'm saying? And so, but I tell you that is because I had done that. So I was working on my superpower. Uh, and as I was working on my superpower, I had meeting upon meeting. And, and I was supposed to go uh, speak, to do this series of videos with a local church. This was in the middle, uh, in the height of a lot of the racial tension that was happening. And so being honest with you, you know how it is. Like black dude in the South, multi-ethnic church. So churches that aren't multi-ethnic, hey, come talk to us, black guy. You know what I'm saying? And so um, <laughs> just being real. And so I went to do that, right? right? Um, it's like phone the black friend. And so, um, and so I go to speak to this church about what all was happening uh, in the talk on this issue of race and reconciliation, whatever. So I was going, and so I was like, hey, I've got to get over to the church on the other side of town. So I finished my one meeting, you know, and I literally had to get to the other side of town in about seven or eight minutes or something like that, okay? And so I'm like, hey, I've seen Fast and Furious, no worries, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Vin Diesel, Paul, you know, bam, and I'm going to get there. And so I got my route, I'm going, I'm heading, I've been in Tallahassee 20 plus years, I know where everything's at, I've pretty much been to most parts of the 
city. So I'm going, this is the quickest way. So I'm heading down this road. It's a two-way road. All of a sudden, I look ahead. I see that there's construction that is happening. Now, again, in that moment, I was really frustrated. I've driven on this road for 20 years, and there's not been an ounce of construction that's happened on this road. And now, all of a sudden, today, you know, and then I start getting real spiritual, and, you know, the enemy's attacking, you know, all that. I had nothing to do with that stack too many meetings, but, you know, the enemy, you know, he's attacking. And so, all of a sudden, um, I go, and so I'm frustrated now, because you know how it is. You're late, so your anxiety's picking up. And so now, all of a sudden, all the cars take the detour, right? They see the detour sign, so you follow the detour sign. And so, we're all going, we're following the detour sign, and, and so I'm just following the people. And so, I'm in my head. I don't know if you had that moment where you're in your head so much, where you're frustrated, you're having all these arguments, you're even making up excuses to tell the people why you're late, and all that. And so, you know those moments when you're driving, and you just blank out, and don't even realize you're driving, and then you come to, like, five minutes, like, oh, how'd I get here? You know, like, it freaks you out, because you're like, oh my gosh, I, did I hit somebody on my way here? And something happened. And so, I finally come to out of this trance of frustration and anxiety, and now all of a sudden there was this long line of cars before, now it's just two. And one of the cars pulls into a driveway. So now I'm following this one car. So now I go from being late to now being a stalker <laughs> because I don't know where I'm at. And so I'm following these cars, and as I'm following this car through, next thing you know, this car pulls into a true story, pulls into a cul-de-sac, and pulls into their house, I guess. And I'm just stuck at a dead end. <laughs> and see, I think about that, and it makes me think about our current moment. That many of us will follow crowds, and we're going to end up in a dead end, and we're going to ask, how do we get here? See, when I left that cul-de-sac and, you know, I had access, right? I had ways and all those things. I finally, you know, put the address in where I was going. But as I was coming back out to find the road, I saw all the signs that I'd missed before. Wow. And many of us are missing the signs that we're following the madness of crowds. We're following radical extremism. See, I believe in our world today, there's a demonic undertow that's taking us to places. And I talk of political left, political right, this has nothing to do with politics, but the fact that it's one of the things that's captured our world today. And so we get taken out to the right, or we get taken out to the left, and what we'll say is, well, you know, those are just for all the crazy people. That's like my crazy uncle who at Thanksgiving, you know, the guy who you never want to talk to anyway, like he's that guy, you know, he's the guy, you know, who says tear down all structure, and he believes in the autonomous, you know, city, and, and uh, you know, up in Portland, and all the Antifa guys, and, or that's that one, you know, he's a QAnon conspiracy guy, and, and all that, and we think it's just them, but truth be told is that it's actually a lot more. When you actually read polling and data, we are becoming more and more divided. And here's where it really freaks me out. Jesus followers are the ones who are going there the fastest. When they poll evangelicals about extremist views, you begin to see how we're drifting. And we're living in madness. At the beginning of this year, in one week, we saw madness at the height of our nation. At the early in the week at the Capitol, and we know about the Capitol riots, but there's something else that happened. There was a senator, I believe from Missouri, gets up and he prays a prayer. And as he finishes his prayer, he says, amen. And then right after that, he says, a woman. And so I'm watching it. And in one of the greatest, I think, theological movies ever, Princess Bride, I'm recalling, I don't think that word means what you think it means. <laughs> like we take a biblical word that has man in it, and now in the name of diversity and inclusion, we now change a biblical word that has nothing to do with gender to now make it about gender. That's crazy. But also, later that week, we all saw where people stormed the seat of democracy to save our republic. And people saying we're doing this and some in the name of God as they bowed with, with American flags and Confederate flags. And matter of fact, can we show this picture that we have? I think we still have it. Um, 
we don't, it's okay. Um, but there's this picture that, we, that I had, and it really was both. It was, you got to see the man praying, but you also got to see people marching in the Capitol with a Confederate flag. It looked like a movie. Yeah. There's this one picture that I caught, it literally like a theater. It looked like someone was exiting stage left with the Confederate flag, another guy, the QAnon shaman, dressed up like Captain Caveman, right? Um, with like, you know, with all this thing on with a police shield. And what's really interesting is picture, he's standing there with his picture, the guy's pro posting, and above him is a picture of Charles Sumner. Charles Sumner was a leading, one of the leading abolitionists during the time of Civil War. It looked like a movie. And as the political philosopher Bruno Micaiah says, America is going to virtualism. We live in virtual reality. We've expanded as far as we can to the West. Now we have to expand to this place to where we make up our own worlds. And unfortunately, that is where America is going. Unfortunately, that is where many of us are going, that we've created our own worlds. We are living in virtual reality, that we make up our own truth. We make up our own feelings. This is just true to me. Why? Because it just feels true to me. Okay, so if I reach deep within and pull out whatever I want to pull out, that I can be a dancing unicorn who plays in the NBA because that's just what I want to do. Because why? Because it's inside of me, and that's just what I feel. And, and so we do that, and it's not true. Or, or listen, our, our world's going too sideways again. I mean, we're pushing too far to the, to the left. We allow these ideologies to push us and we have to stand. And what we think is this, if we just make slogans and we just chant certain things that everything's going to be okay. And here's the truth about it. We are going mad as a country. And unfortunately, Jesus followers, we are following the madness of those crowds. Just like I follow these people through this neighborhood, not looking at the signs. And God is using today, hopefully for some of you to say, look at the signs. You are heading to a day dead in. Let me tell you this, where these worldviews go is where every worldview has gone before to a place of outright self-worship. Underneath political left and political right is this, it's radical individualism. That is it. Oh no, you don't understand. And so the question becomes, what are we going to do? We are living in this digital disruption that is changing everything. Where suicide rates among 10 to 14 year olds is up almost 150%. 2,300 people in Japan killed themselves in one month. We are living in desperate times, but I am in a place of such hope because it's always through history in these moments God moves. But let me tell you this, serving Jesus like it's always been meant to be will be the hardest thing that you'll ever do. You won't have the cultural push to actually to do it. Now, to stand out for Jesus, you're going to look different. To stand out for Jesus and what you say, you're going to look different. To stand out for Jesus now, it's going to be different. You have to understand, I'm a black man who builds a diverse space. I'm a black man who works within corporate America to where for some people, I am way too radical for others. I'm not black enough. And here's what I care. I don't care what they think. Why? Because when I die, I will not stand and give an account to any of them. I will stand and give an account for God. And let me tell you this, everyone in this room, you will stand and give an account for God for the life you live. Let me tell you this, the radical right or the political left will not stand with you. You will stand before God and give an account. Did you know my son and what did you do with him? And we're living in times where we got to quit blaming everyone. Like the media, it's the big bad boogeyman. Instead of asking myself this question, why all of a sudden does the big bad boogeyman push me to say things I shouldn't say? It's amazing we'll say personal responsibility, but we'll blame the media for everything in the world. There comes a point in time as Jesus followers, you have to stand on your two feet and decide that in our generation, I will not compromise no matter what it costs me. And that is the world we're going to. And it's not for the faint of heart. It is not for those who will flinch, but it's for men and women who are willing to humble themselves. Men and women who are willing to seek after Jesus and willing no matter what it may cost them to remain faithful in this generation. You better be known more for being faithful to the kingdom than you are to the empire. Because never mistake it, America is an empire. We are in the lines of Babylon, Rome, Assyria. That's what we are. We just have had Christian ethics baked into it. And what Jesus is doing, he is ripping nationalism and the gospel apart. And people are going mad. Yeah, wow. Oh, well, hold on now. You got to talk about the other side. 
this thing of justice. Because we're so emotionally immature as a country, we can't hold two truths at once. Oh. I can care about the unborn. I actually believe in a free market. But I also care about ending systemic oppression, and I care about the poor widow orphan and immigrant. You can't do that. Yes, I can. I'm a functioning, healthy adult. <laughs> and my words are my words. Because just because two political parties have taken two things of the gospel, now all of a sudden we have to be in one side, and I refuse to take either side. Great. And some of you right now, you want to be known way more for the political party you're affiliated with than you actually want to be known for the kingdom of God. And you will give an account in your life for God for what you did. And some of you need to stop trying to be experts of everyone else and start becoming an expert of yourself. I learned a long time ago from my therapist. He said this, and he's a phenomenal man. He says, Adrian, when you start learning to be an expert of self, you'll be able to see culture in such an incredible way. Many of you, you have no idea how you feel, and you project it on everyone else. That's free therapy for you for the day, okay? Here we go. That would cost you like $300 an hour. Here we go. Now, so here's what we're going to do. I got to get to this message, and I got to land this plane fast, all right? So here's what's going to happen. Buckle your seatbelt, okay? Like, this isn't one of those, like, easy flights, okay? This is one of those flights where, you know what, man, we got to get there. It's late at night. You know, the 11 o'clock, the last flight, and the pilot just wants to get home, and he just speeds through. You're like, dude, we are flying through. There was actual, like, police up here. We would get pulled over in the sky. That's what's about to happen, okay? So buckle up. This is about to happen, okay? So here's what we're going to do. How do we live in the midst of madness of crowds? We have to live as a peaceable people. We have to live as a peaceful people. That word peace means flourishing. That word peace means shalom. It's the way things ought to work. We are called in the midst of madness as the world, in the midst of radical individualism. It's the king structure. It's the king family. It's the king social structure. It's the king education and finance. We're called to be people who actually bring the kingdom to bring wholeness to it. And we're going to look at a group in the Bible today who you probably never heard of, I don't think they had a veggie tales about them, which again, I am really bothered by this. It's a group called the Rechabites. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Jeremiah 35. 35 is not, it'll pop up right on the screen. Jeremiah 35 says this. This is the message the Lord gave to Jeremiah when Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, was king of Judah. Go to the settlement where the families of the Rechabites live. Invite them to the Lord's temple. Take them into one of the inner rooms and offer them some wine. Skipping down to verse 12. Then the Lord gave this message to Jeremiah. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. Go and say to the people in Judah and Jerusalem, come and learn a lesson about how to obey me. The Rechabites do not drink wine to this day because their ancestor Jehonadab told them not to. But I have spoken to you again and again, and you refuse to obey me. Time after time, I sent you prophets who told you, turn from your wicked ways and start doing things right. Stop worshiping other gods so that you might live in peace here in the land. I've given you and your ancestors, but you would not listen to me or obey me. The descendants of Jonadab, son of Rechab, have obeyed their ancestors completely, but he have refused to listen to me. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says, because you refuse to listen or answer when I call, I will send upon Judah and Jerusalem all the disasters I have threatened. Then Jeremiah turned to the Rechabites and said, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says. You have obeyed your ancestors, Jehonadab, in every respect, following all of his instructions. Therefore, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says, Jehonadab, son of Rechab, will always have descendants who serve me. This is the reading of God's word. I don't have time to go to the history of what was happening in Israel. What I will tell you is this about Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a son of a priest from a town called Anathoth. Jeremiah thought that's what he was going to be. God shows up to him and says, no, you're called to be a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah's whole life trajectory changed. And we know we quote that scripture in Jeremiah chapter one. Let me tell you this. Uh, you know, I know the plans you have for me, plans to prosper you, all that. Yeah, that's all good until you actually have to live in God's calling for your life, okay? If you ever read Jeremiah's calling, literally go read Jeremiah 17, 18. Jeremiah literally is cursing the guy who announced his birth. You know how depressed you have to be to curse the person who just made the announcement, just doing his job. Hey, we have a son. Curse that man, bring destruction on him. We're like, like, 
fam, you need therapy. Seriously, it's okay, all right? But Jeremiah was called to be this prophet, and God would use Jeremiah in his experiential ways. He would have him go and experience the prophecy. We see him at the potter's house. And this time, he says, hey, I want you to go to this group called the Rechabites. Now, the Rechabites were this guild of metal workers. They were the ones you went to. If you had a chariot, a javelin, you had a sword, you have something that, was, that needed help. I mean, they were experts. I mean, they were this group that when there was really high level of metal work that had to be done, you went to the Rechabites. The Rechabites were started 250 years prior through a man by the name of Jehonadab. God shows up to him and said, listen, I want you, if you, I want you to set apart of, of not drinking wine not owning land, vineyards, anything. I don't want you to to live in houses. I want you and your people to be set apart and to really live as nomads. This is your call. And so if you know anything about a guild uh, throughout that time, the trade secrets were passed down. So they arranged marriages and all this. They were a certain type of group. And so now this group who lived outside the city that people knew about, actually the Rechabites now were living in the city walls because the Babylonians were coming and they feared for their lives. So now this group that stayed separate from culture was dead smack in the middle of culture. A moral decay Israel. Idol worship at the the highest it had ever been. People who were claiming Yahweh showing up to church on a Sunday and turning around and sacrificing children the next day. That was the culture they were in drunkenness, idolatry, and on and on. And so now God says, invite those people. Can you imagine if you're Jeremiah? I mean, like, why, God? Why do I always have to be this guy? You know what I'm saying? Like, we know they don't drink, God. Why are you doing this? Why are you going to tempt them? Why would you do that? And the city began to hear about it, right? Because they heard about Jeremiah and how wild Jeremiah was. They knew who he was, you know, the crazy boy from Anathoth, right? He's always about to do something sick. And so all of a sudden, they didn't know if Jeriah had a wine subscription or what. We're like, yo, he's bribing them over there, the Rechabites. I don't know if it's going to be white, it's going to be red. Like, we don't know what's going to happen, but they're going to have this wine tasting party. And so they show up at the temple, and the Rechabites show up. And here's what happens as they show up. Jeremiah offers them wine. He doesn't know fully what's going on. He offers them wine, and... And they say, we don't do that. See, the Rechabites could have just said, you know what? Dude, we need to just fit in. Listen, dude, we're already the weird group. Like, you know, we're the weird, you know, we're the weird kids in class. So uh, let's just go ahead and just go along with the crowd. They could have said, well, who's really going to know? Babylon's coming, like. Are we really going to be around? So we might as well go out with a bang, right? Like, but they remain faithful. And God says to Jeremiah, he says, this is what I wanted for the people of Israel. I wanted them to live like the Rechabites, a distinct people. Because if you go back to Genesis 12, that this, this one man, through this one family, through this one nation, that I would make you be a blessing to the world to show the world how it should work. And do you know that same blessing that was passed to Abraham now passed to us as Jesus followers? And our job as Jesus followers is to show the world how it should work. But many times we are involved way too much in civilian affairs. So two things that God says. He says they answered, they listened, and they answered. And how do we live as a peaceful people? The first thing is this, is this idea to be willing to listen. See, they gave him a word 250 years prior, so they had to listen to that word. See, like, they, Johannadab had to make a decision that I'm going to actually listen to the word that was just given to me. This word that was just passed off, I'm going to actually listen to it, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to listen to the words that came from God and now begin to shape my life around it. We are living in a time in the era where all of us in here, we don't even know at times what is actual truth. When you go on social media outlets, if you're like me, you got to feel like you're Sherlock Holmes or some investigative reporter to actually see what you are seeing. Is it real or not? Is this a deep fake video or not? I have no earthly idea. And after a while, I get so exhausted cross-checking and double-checking and calling this person to see if it's just a simple video of like, hey, when are we getting COVID vaccines, right? Like, I don't know now. And so he thinks we're all exhausted. We don't know what truth is. And let me tell you this right now. We have to become a people that listen 
listen to truth, and truth starts with the Word of God. The Word of God has to become the thing that shapes your life. We have to dive in. It's always been critical, but more than ever, we have to make a decision that the Word of God will define our lives, that we will orient our lives around the Word. We will listen to the Word. Or let me tell you this, or you will listen to others because everyone is fighting for your attention. We are living in this attention graph. Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Google, Peloton, whoever wants your attention. Everyone's fighting for your attention in your ear. Tesla fights for your attention in your ear. Everybody wants it. And the question is this. Will you listen to truth or will you listen to the madness of crowds? Let me tell you this. MSNBC wants your ear. Newsmax wants your ear. The person you follow on Twitter wants your ear. Or will you listen to truth? And many of you lean your ear more to things of this world than you actually do the things of God. And you're wondering, well, what do you mean? When was the last time you actually opened up the word, you actually read the word and said, God, what would you have me do? But some of us, you know more policies than you actually do scripture. Will you listen? It simply comes down to this. You've heard it said a lot in this church, lordship. This Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Before Jesus is ever your friend, he's your Lord. My son is 16 years old now, and he is turning to one of my best friends. And let me tell you this, but before he became one of my best friends, he had to understand I was his father. Many of you in here, you just try to vote Jesus and his policies in like it's a democracy. It's a kingdom, and there's a king. And what his edicts are is how we should live. But are you willing to listen? The second thing you have to do is you have to answer They said they were willing. They said the Rechabites answered. Here's what happened with the Rechabites. Jehonadab gets this word, and here's what he does. He literally begins to structure their entire lives around being obedient to the word God gave him, that he began to now structure, hey, we can't live in cities now. Again, hey, God said, we don't want you owning land. I don't want you taking of wine. So he had to say, for us to remain faithful, here are these things, these distinct disciplines in order to hold to the word. In times of madness, you have to begin to have a distinct discipline to hold to the word of God. And let me tell you this, for some of us, listen, some words are going to be harder to hold because of our natural bent and proclivities that we have. And so you may not struggle with alcohol. So getting drunk is not something you really have to discipline yourself so much, but actually being greedy maybe so giving has to become a distinct discipline or with your body. It must be a distinct discipline. Just walking and randomly trying to figure out how to be like Jesus was never the case. It was never the course. I was going to let the spirit guide you. No, no, no. The spirit is within you. The spirit wants to remind you and you have to discipline your life in order to live out what you're trying to get to. Because in in the end, the Bible has the commandments. But let me tell you this about the Bible. It has we, how we should live, but it doesn't tell us step by step how to get there. I wish Jesus did. I wish sometimes he's like, yo, idiot. Don't go there. Okay, I will not go there. I wish he was like, I'm dumb. Like, I need him to say that to me sometimes. But you know what he does? He gives us freedom because as we allow the spirit to go, we begin to discipline our lives to move forward. And what we will do in our culture today, we will put impersonal pressures on people to live a certain way versus personal commands. Here's what I mean. We all came up, Pastor Clayton, Kelly and I, we came up in a time of I kissed dating goodbye. And so here's what happened. It was a book. It's a good book. It's about a guy, his process of honoring God. Here's what it became, a religion. Now, nobody, listen, nobody can date. And then we wonder why people are freaking weird because they didn't know how to talk to people. Some of y'all grew up in that area. You're like, yeah, I remember that, right? Because why? We, somebody takes a principle, a distinct discipline for them, and then they try to make it impersonal for everyone. 
Instead of realizing, no, the point is this, to honor God in your relationship. So how you do that, you have to be guided by the Holy Spirit, his word, and community that can help you. But if we're going to live this way and we're going to breathe this way and actually stand as a distinct people, we have to have a distinct discipline. So I want to ask you, what is that for you? For some of you right now, that may mean right now because of the height of what social media pushes in your soul, it allows you to get angry, mad, where you begin to not like people, you begin to curse people, you begin to strip people as image bearers of God, you may need to say, hey, you know what, for the next little bit, I'm shutting out all my social media accounts. Oh, no, you can't do that. That's, that's treading on my freedom. Your body was bought at a cost. You're no longer your own. You are a slave to righteousness, meaning what? You're in God's kingdom. You do what the king tells you to do. Jesus is not someone you can vote out of office. He's going to sit on that throne if you like it or not. You can shake your fist, and I'm not going to do it. All. Great, fine. You're just like a child screaming around, and he doesn't, okay, when you're done with this temper tantrum, we can move on. <laughs> and why does this matter is because I actually believe those who are willing to become this distinct people, to be a peaceable people, that we're on the beginning of actually seeing renewal in the earth. And I think 30 years from now, we're going to look back and we're going to see as bad as COVID. Hall of 2020, I played with Kobe. My heart breaks. We lost so many people. We saw so much stuff. But yet and still, we're going to look back 20, 30 years and be like, man, God began to do something there. Yes. See, what God is doing in the earth, he's breaking his people up. See, I believe this, hey, it's, this is, has nothing to do with mask and, and lockdown and all that. What I actually believe God's allowing to happen is to do this. Why we can't gather, I know we all love to gather. He's actually shaking his church to say you've never been meant to all be together. You've been meant to go to the world and to take my spirit where you go. Do you understand that when the veil tore, it was a sign saying that my spirit would no longer be in one place. It would no longer be in the temple, but actually my presence is called to go all throughout the world. And so let me tell you this, why I started, Pastor Clayton said, I started another business in consulting and focus on the idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion is this, is because what I kept seeing in the world were people who were not practitioners at building diverse space, trying to teach corporations to do it, and there was no movement happening. And so I could sit here, complain, and say how dumb these people are, and you guys have no idea what you're doing, or I could actually get in the game and be the answer to prayer prayers of people. Some of you need to pray, but you need to be feet that answer prayers. You don't like what you're seeing in political, you don't like what you're seeing in county commission, then get involved. If you don't like what you're seeing and man, people aren't being uplifted in your workplace, are you advocating for those people? God is looking in the earth of who's going to go for me. He's just looking, and I believe those who are willing to do it, no matter what it costs them, he's going to breathe life on you. But we have to be a peaceable people. We have to be a committed people. We have to be a distinct people. But we have to return to our first love. As we close, I want to ask you that question honestly. Do you really love Jesus? I'm not talking about perfection, guys. I'm not talking about, oh, man, you know what I've been, yeah, I've been doing good for the last like three or four weeks. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about is the desire of your heart to orient your entire life around Jesus. I mean to where even if your family's going to think you're some far-right conservative or you're some Marxist, are you willing to choose the kingdom no matter what people say? Are you willing to deny your flesh what you want? Are you willing to be disliked? Are you willing to go into worlds where people who don't like you, you're able to lift them up? God told me in the midst of all this COVID, 
I'm calling you to go to places to plant churches where racism was at its highest. And I want you to plant multi-ethnic communities. I want you to plant the flag of Jesus in Alabama. I want you to plant the flag of Jesus in Georgia. I want you to plant the flag of Jesus in Louisiana. I want you to go into corporate world and you're going to have to listen to people talk to you. And you're going to have to listen to people say things to you that are very racist. But you're called to represent me, to speak truth, but also to be tough enough to make room to allow them. And I can't tell you watching what God is doing. People who are CEOs, their hearts changing of what they thought about a person to now it's changing. And it's not because of me, it's just the Spirit of God. I feel this very strongly in this moment. Some of you, God is wanting you to begin to dream again about how he can use you. All you've ever thought about is going to church, serving on a team, which you should keep doing. But this walk with Jesus is way bigger than that. Some of you have shut down what it is that you felt God has called you to do and he's saying, dream again. But you have to make a commitment. Are you willing to go where he's going to tell you to go? No matter how painful it may be. I'm not promising you riches. I'm not promising you all this prosperity the world says. But what I will promise you, if you'll commit to Jesus, that you'll have the shalom of God that would mark you and his presence will mark you. Father, I thank you for everyone that's here. And while we're in this attitude of prayer, if you're in here and you're saying, listen, I want to be marked as distinct. God, I have been floating. I have been doing this. I've been following the madness of crowds and whatever. It may not be political. It may be a social. It may be physical, whatever. But you right now in this moment, you're saying, God, I literally want to make this a marker, a boundary stone moment in my life to say, God, I'm going all in with you, that I'm going to be a distinct person. I'm going to live like the Rechabites. God, I'm going to, I'm going to listen and I'm going to answer. If that is you, if you are here physical, if you're online, I want you just to lift your hands right where you're at so I can pray for you right now. And so again, God bless you and God bless you. Is there anybody else? God bless you to saying, God, I want you to use me. Listen, this is a moment. God bless you that you're saying that I want God to keep those hands up. If you're at home, keep those hands up. Listen, we just make an external, this is an external sign of eternity what's happening. Father, I pray for every person who's responding. And see, guys, if you are, I just want you to right now to Jesus say, Jesus, I commit. Jesus, I commit to you. I give you my life. I'm your servant. God, help me to live a distinct life. Help me always to listen. Help me always to answer when you call. Father, I pray your Holy Spirit would breathe life on these people right now. Those here, those watching, breathe life right now. We love you. We honor you. It's in the wonderful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. And I, I want to give us a chance, uh, as we do every week, you know, we talked about we got to listen and then we have to answer. And in these moments here at church, like it's real easy to, to do the listening and to have like this heart response that then doesn't actually turn out to be a life response. That's why we, we put something up like texting in this, you know, this idea next step. Is that gonna, you're like, I, I send a text and then everything's fine after that? No, but it's a next step. And then after that, you take the next step after that. And then you take the next step after that. But it always starts with that first step. You listen, but are you gonna answer? And for some of you, that's like, oh, well, I, I need to learn how to give my life to him. Like, I, how do I recommit my life to What does that look like? Like, how would you know that ahead of time? Say you wanna do it and then be like, oh yeah, I just downloaded all into my brain. Like, well, then that would be different than anybody else. Like, I, I'd have somebody help me, somebody teach me. I, I, I would assume you'd be probably the same. What a privilege for us to be able to do that with you. Maybe it's to learn how to read the Bible. Maybe it's to learn how to be in community with other believers. Again, whatever that next step is, my encouragement is whether it's texting in or heading to somebody at our next steps table or making a comment in the chat to actually go and do that. And the second way for you to be able to respond today is by the taking of communion. Communion is this, this, this tradition, this, this, this supernatural ceremony that Jesus gave to us 2,000 years ago. And every time we do it, it's a chance for us to remember and to proclaim. And so we don't ever want it to be with like casualness or, or you know, it's just, oh, it's this thing we do at the end of service. It's a chance for us to worship. It's a chance for us to remember how powerful and significant his sacrifice for us. 
It's a chance for us to remember that we don't have to just wait for him, but we can respond to him and proclaim how we want to live our lives. So I want to ask you to do this. If you would stand with me, this is the last thing we do before I dismiss you. We're going to take a moment. We're just going to pray and prepare our hearts. And then I'm going to lead us into corporate prayer and then the taking of these elements. We don't come to the same table. We don't eat from the same loaf anymore, but this is a chance for us to commune not only with each other, but with God. And so that's one of the reasons why we pray this prayer out loud together so that we are communing with each other even if we are doing so from a distance. So would you pray this with me? Christ, body and blood, his life for ours was given. This bread and this cup tells us we're forgiven. Fill me with your spirit, Let strife and division cease. I pray to be made whole, a person of your peace. The bread, juice. Now may the Lord bless you, keep you, make his face shine upon you that the love of God, grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Now go and make disciples who change the world. We love you guys so much. Have a great week.